Hey guys. So people are gonna be trickling in throughout. We have a lot of pre-registrations that are, haven't arrived yet, like well over half. So um, no worries about that. And I'd like to welcome you to the 2012 Duke Environmental Law Symposium, Conservative Visions of Our Environmental Future. Um, the conference is co-sponsored by Duke Environmental Law and Policy Forum, the Duke Federal Society, Duke College Republicans, and the Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy Solutions. Uh, we're thrilled to bring you a slightly different take on these pressingly important issues. My name is David, and I am a liberal. That AA introduction doesn't exactly sound right in this context, because liberal environmentalism is, are anything, is anything but anonymous. Liberal environmentalism is vocal and loud, making up for the surprising silence of our Prius engines with the slogans screaming from the bumper stickers. Save the whales, no fracking way. Of course, there are bumper stickers in response. They're often on the back of a pickup truck that could fit a few Priuses in the tailgate, flanked by a fading McCain Palin sticker. Reduce carbon emissions, shoot an environmentalist. Green is the new red. In that last one, the G in green is made with a hammer and sickle, as if the sticker is attempting to do an old Yakov Smirnoff bit. In Soviet Russia, aluminum can recycle you. Um, and that's what the environmental debate has become. Bumper stickers. Today, we aim to get past the screaming stereotypes. By presenting one general side of the environmental debate, we hope to begin a national discussion that begins with reasonable analysis rather than moral diatribes. This applies to both sides. The liberal enviro hippies, and I include myself in that group, need to confront cost-benefit analysis in the free market. Conservative economists need to consider both externalities and environmental ethics. <laughs> By presenting brilliant minds today, like Jeff Holmstead, Bob English, Jonathan Adler, and all of our other speakers, we hope to change the basis of the discussion. So good people come to different conclusions on how to solve environmental problems. We might never start in the same ideological place, but if the debate stays in bumper sticker land, then we will always be screaming past each other. However, if we can combine liberal and conservative ideals, then we might be able to reach a sustainable, positive vision of our environmental future. Because that's what's at stake, the future. By speaking rather than screaming, we can change the future. And in the process, we can change the world. So going off script now, um, the event will proceed with panels followed by a keynote and then two more panels. And the way this is gonna work is that I'll introduce our speakers and then Jess Lee will introduce them on other later panels. They'll get up, give 10 to 20 minutes of prepared remarks, after which they'll go sit at this table with the other panelists and we'll have a question and answer session which will be asked from the podium. So we're gonna have ushers that walk up and down the aisle with question sheets. Fill those out with a pen, you know, whatever you'd like with questions and then we'll ask them from the podium um, and yeah, that's about it. And without further ado, I'll introduce our first speaker on our first panel, Climate, Energy, and a Path Forward. Our first speaker is an economist focusing on energy, envi environment, environmental, and regulatory issues is the Herbert and Joyce Morgan Fellow at the Heritage Foundation. Nick Loris's research has been described as crucial to advancing our understanding of the relationship between energy and the environment. Nick's work has been published or quoted in just about every national media outlet, from the Washington Post to the Wall Street Journal, and we are thrilled to have him today. And without further ado, Nick Lars. Thank you, David. Uh, what he omitted was that my mom is the one who said that my work is crucial to energy and the environment. Um, but at least it's one person. Uh, I want to thank Duke University and, and the sponsors of this event. Um, I'm excited to be here. Uh, 
you're in for a treat. I think uh, you're going to be excited by the, the following panelists, uh, especially Reed Watson, who promised some interpretive dance for y'all later. So you've got that to look forward to. Um, and, and David's introduction really leads in, into uh, where I look at this debate, too. And when I talk about uh, climate energy and a path forward, I can't help but think of all of the, the policies that have driven us backwards economically uh, when trying to address climate change. And, and part of the problem, I think, is, is what David really got into, is that uh, you need to step back and actually take a look at, at the climate change debate. And it's become so polarized and so dramatized that you have politicians and political pundits uh, who love the limelight who say, global warming isn't happening, climate change isn't occurring, man has nothing to do with it. Uh, and then you have politicians and, and pundits uh, who also like the limelight who say we're headed towards an imminent catastrophe and we need to do everything and anything possible uh, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And, and really I don't think either of those cases are, are true. Uh, I think we can acknowledge that the climate is changing uh, and that man-made emissions uh, are playing a, a role, are a warming agent. I don't really know of a climatologist uh, who thinks otherwise. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean uh, you have to make the huge jump that we're headed towards sea level rises uh, that are, are going to flood Manhattan. Uh, I think you can take a, a rational approach to this. And I think you'd have a discussion uh, as to what those sea level rises might be, although I think a much more realistic assumption is, is inches rather than feet. And I think you can have an open and honest discussion uh, about whether the positive externalities of carbon dioxide emissions outweigh the, the negative externalities. You know, there's a lot of peer-reviewed literature on, on increased CO2 emissions in the atmosphere, increasing plant growth, uh, reducing soil erosion, uh, improving seed enrichment, um, and, and having that open and honest debate about uh, the positive externalities and the negative externalities of more carbon in the atmosphere. So I think having those debates and having the debate over climate and climate sensitivity, what a doubling of greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere would do, uh, because that's where the, the differing amongst climatologists really is. And having a more open and honest dis discussion about that, I think, is the, the first step we need to take forward. But where, where I come in uh, as an econ policy guy, uh, and I think what's most important to me, is the fact that a lot of these policies that are aimed to reduce global warming or reduce climate change and, and reduce greenhouse gas emissions uh, do a lot to hurt us economically, benefit special interest groups, and, and will do pretty much nothing to actually reduce global temperatures. Uh, you, know, you can look at the, the bigger policy proposals, the cap and trades, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency regulations of greenhouse gas emissions. You know, these come with huge costs to our economy because 85% of our energy comes from carbon emitting fossil fuels. And so not only will your electricity prices rise, your gas prices rise, but because energy is necessary for just about everything we make and do, sticker price rises for, for all goods and services, consumers demand less, producers produce less, and, and you have higher uh, unemployment. And you can look at the, the current recessionary environment as, as really living proof of that. You know, carbon emissions and greenhouse gas emissions have been down in the United States, uh, partly because natural gas is replacing coal in terms of electricity generation, but also uh, because we're producing and consuming a lot less. So have, you have these huge costs. Um, and, and where I have the most problem with a lot of the, these policies is that they won't do anything to actually reduce global temperatures. And the Heritage Foundation recently released a, a product called the American Conservation Ethic uh, that, that looks at really free market environmentalism and, and fundamental reforms to a lot of the, the environmental acts, uh, the Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, and, and really builds off a, a lot of the work uh, that, that, that the subsequent speakers uh, ha have done for years. And one of the guiding principles of that report is that efforts to reduce and remediate pollution should have real uh, achievable environmental benefits, and that's where I think a lot of these policies fall flat on their face. And climatologists have modeled uh, what the effects of, of cap-and-trade proposals would do, uh, looking at what an 83 percent reduction uh, in CO2 levels uh, by the year 2050 would do, 
and, and found that it would only reduce the Earth's temperature uh, by hundredths of a degree Celsius in the year 2050 and at most 0.2 degrees Celsius in the year 2100. And, and largely that's because uh, a unilateral approach to this won't do anything to, to actually mitigate climate change and, and that's been acknowledged uh, even by EPA Administrator Lisa Jackson saying that a unilateral approach to this won't have any measurable impact. And as economies like and, and countries like India and China continue to develop uh, their economies, CO2 emissions will be a byproduct of that and they have made it uh, affirmative that they're not going to, to curb their carbon dioxide emissions and, and I don't necessarily think that they should either. That They're growing uh, economically uh, and, and they have real environmental problems to address like gaining access to clean air uh, and clean drinking water uh, and, and two, a, a lot, millions of these people in these countries don't even have access to power or electricity. Uh, if you remember a couple months ago there was uh, headlines uh, of that major power outage in India and, and the headlines were all 600 million people uh, without power uh, in India as a result of this power outage but 400 million people in India have never had power to begin with. Uh, so I think you have to recognize that these countries uh, are, are growing economically and they're going to continue to produce CO2 emissions uh, and I really think it's immoral to, to suggest that, that they do otherwise. I talked about you know, some of the bigger proposals to, to reduce CO2 emissions. Uh, there's a lot of smaller pr proposals, uh, especially coming from, from Washington, uh, under the, the umbrella of reducing greenhouse gas emissions and, and curbing carbon dioxide, but, but really, uh, again, go to benefit uh, special interest groups, go to benefit politicians, uh, and, and disperse the costs amongst the rest of us as taxpayers and as consumers. And typically, I think the, the way we need to move forward is by uh, removing all of the subsidies and market distortions in the energy sector for, for all sources of energy. Um, you know, and that they come in a wide variety of forms. You know, direct expenditures, targeted tax credits, loan guarantees, uh, Department of Energy spend spending on, on things that the, the private sector should be research and developing. Uh, th there's plenty of subsidies to pick apart, and I think we need to pick apart all of them. Um, because the energy economy is a robust and diverse one already, and, and there's a huge incentive to be a part of that. You know, globally, the electricity markets and the transportation fuel markets, these are multi-trillion dollar economies uh, globally. Uh, if any producer can create a technology that, that captures just a sliver of that market, uh, they shouldn't need any help from, from the government. And, and you can look at, at the Department of Energy Loan Guarantee Program as a perfect example of this. Uh, one of the conditions of the DOE Loan Guarantee Program, uh, well, there's two conditions, actually. One of them is that the, the producers have to demonstrate that they have an uh, economically viable product. Uh, and the second condition is they have to demonstrate that they can't get private financing. Uh, in economics, that's a a Venn diagram where the circles are like this. Uh, it, it just doesn't work. You know, the, the fact that they can't get private financing demonstrates that they aren't economically viable projects yet. Uh, and, and that's not to say uh, we can't have more renewables, we can't have more nuclear uh, as a part of our energy portfolio, but this should be driven by markets and competition, not subsidies and mandates. And, you know, that's only part of the problem with subsidies, the fact that they encourage dependence on the government uh, and they, they fail to realize that their true cost uh, point uh, in the marketplace and, and you have this uh, continual pickers, picking of winners and losers in the marketplace uh, and this uh, dependence will start with, you know, lobbyists coming into a, a politician's office and saying, hey, we have this great idea, this great technology, all we need is $5 billion from the taxpayers in terms of targeted tax credits. Uh, by the way, we'll build the plant in your district and that'll help you come election time. And we'll be good to go from there. And then five years later, uh, they're back in the office asking for a three-year extension and now the politician is locked into this because they don't want to see the factory uh, go bankrupt in their district. Uh, and you have this, uh, again, crony capitalism uh, where lobbyists and politicians are deciding who builds what uh, rather than uh, it being driven by the private sector. Uh, and I think you can have tougher rules on lobbying, you know, that, that might help at, at, to some extent,
but I think really you have to get rid of the root cause and, and get rid of the, the government making uh, economic decisions that, that are best left for the private sector to be making. And, and rather than picking these projects off of political profit, we need to pick them off economic incentives. So I think the path forward uh, really needs to begin with dismantling what happened uh, in, in the past, over the past few decades of bad energy policy, and we, and we continue to see it from, from both the right and the left. It, it's not uh, the, the fact that uh, just the left ha ha has their political preferences, the right certainly does too, and we need to remove subsidies for, for all energy sources, uh, including fossil fuel ones. Uh, you know, there's plenty of oil subsidies out there that, that we need to get rid of, and I think that the path forward uh, is to returning our energy sector to a more market-driven one. And, you know, creating a robust economy uh, by reducing the, the onerous regulations, uh, the duplicative regulations where the costs overwhelmingly outweigh the benefits, and, and removing subsidies from the energy sector will help grow our economy. And to me, I think that's the best insurance uh, against any climate calamity. Uh, so with that, I thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thanks, Nick, really appreciate it. Our next, our final speaker on the climate and energy panel is Jeff Holmstead. Mr. Holmstead, who served as Assistant Administrator for Air and Radiation at the US EPA during President Bush's first term, now heads the Environmental Strategies Group at Bracewell and Giuliani. This group advises a, ver a variety of companies and business groups on major environmental and energy development challenges. Uh, Holmstead headed EPA's Office of Air and Radiation from 2001 through 2005. During his tenure, he was the architect of several of EPA's most important initiatives, including the Clean Air Interstate Rule, the Clean Air Diesel Rule, the Mercury Rule for Power Plants, and the reform of the New Source Review Program. He also oversaw the development of the Bush administration's Clear Skies legislation and, and was key, and key parts of its Global Climate Change Initiative. Um, he has an incredibly distinguished background, uh, numerous legal in other government organizations, um, and he was also involved in the Clean Air Act amends, amendments of 1990. Uh, we're thrilled to have him today. He's kind of a superstar in this field. Mr. Jeff Holmstead. Uh, well, thank you for that very kind uh, introduction. Superstar, I, I like that. Uh, I wanted to start by just giving you a sense of what it's like to be uh, a Republican appointee at, at EPA. Uh, it was about 11 years ago that I was finally confirmed uh, to the job to head the air office after the requisite uh, fighting on the Capitol Hill and document de demands for documents and other things. And uh, I remember it quite well because shortly after I was confirmed, uh, my parents came out to, to visit. I grew up in Colorado, and my mom and dad were out visiting, and, and, uh, uh, and of course, I wanted them to believe I was an important figure in, uh, I, I was not a superstar yet back in those days. Um, and I, I remember this one morning very well because I got up to go for a run, and uh, uh, you know, just typical 10-mile run, five-minute pace just to start the day out uh, well. And, I, I came back and my father was sitting at the kitchen table reading the Washington Post and I exchanged pleasantries and went upstairs and get in the shower and I'm in the shower and uh, my daughter who was five years old at the time came in and said, Daddy, Daddy, you're withholding information from Congress. <laughs> and I said, what? And she said, it's in the newspaper with your picture, you're withholding information from Congress. <clears throat> and I, I was honestly puzzled, and I said, well, what, what information am I withholding from Congress? And she looked at me uh, like I must not be too bright, and she said, well, how would they know? <laughs> uh, and it, it is true. This, I have to tell you, this, this certainly helped my stock. My parents, they came, they saw my picture was in the, uh, in the Washington Post. They didn't care what I was being accused of, but it was... Uh, uh, it was not the first time, uh, uh, I'm sorry, it was the first time, but not the last time that my picture was in the Washington Post, uh, and right next to it there was a picture of a big uh, smokestack with steam billowing out that looked very menacing, 
and uh, and in the back in the in the foreground you could see children playing on a on a swing set and the clear implication was that uh, this person pictured here was responsible for uh, for for poisoning our our children from these terrible emissions that you can see in the background um, and, and <laughs> It really does, I think, give you a, a bit of a sense for uh, the difficulty of, of trying to engage in kind of a reasonable discussion about environmental policy or energy policy in this kind of a political environment. I want to make uh, one broad statement about, uh, about the, the climate change issues, and I suspect there'll be other questions about those. Uh, and then just talk a little bit more about um, what a conservative vision of our energy future might look like. Um, uh, I, I think we probably share similar views on, on, on many things, uh, but I actually maybe get to the same answer in a slightly different way, because I've been thinking about kind of climate change issues really since the early 1990s and was actually in the first Bush White House uh, when the Clean Air Act amendments were passed. And some of you, well, not very many of you, but a few of you may remember uh, the, the original Rio Ch Climate Change Conference and then the lead up to that. And as I've spent time with, with activists on both sides, as I spent time with economists, what it, what it really comes down to for me is until someone is able to figure out a way to produce energy or to at least provide us with the things that we get today from energy and to do so at a cost that's, that's at least comparable with what we can get today from fossil fuels, th there is no way for us to uh, reduce global CO2 emissions. We certainly can affect CO2 emissions in our country and maybe in a few other parts of the world um, in large part by slowing down economic growth. But uh, at least according to the International Energy Agency, there are roughly two billion people in the world today that have no access to electricity, um, and many more who have no real access to the kind of transportation freedom that we enjoy in the United States. W whether or not we collectively believe that that's a basic human need, um, it clearly is something that is desired uh, throughout the world. And I suspect many of you, like me, have had the opportunity to travel in India and in China and other parts of the developing world. And um, regardless of how much we care about this issue, there is a political imperative in those countries and even a moral imperative to provide people with the basic things that we take for granted here in terms of flipping a switch and getting light um, refrigeration, um, moving along to air conditioning at some point, and the ability to travel around and have the freedom that that, it, that, that entails. Today, in virtually all parts of the world, uh, the most cost-effective way by far to produce electricity is to use coal. Um, and some of you who follow these issues internationally will know uh, that's certainly true in India and China, where uh, every year they are building about the same those two countries collectively in the next year will build uh, new, new coal-fired power plants that emit roughly the equivalent of all the greenhouse gas emissions in the EU uh, as they try to provide that way of life for their citizens. And so if we're serious about reducing CO2 emissions and whether or not you think that's a legitimate goal, I, I focus much more on the practicalities of what that would entail. And I guess my basic conclusion, and I, I won't spend too much time talking about it this morning, but uh, if you really care about reducing global emissions of greenhouse gases, um, if, if we care about the collectively, we ought to put in place the kinds of um, policies and, and the framework that will encourage innovation, that will allow um, somebody someday to provide energy for electricity, for transportation that is cost competitive with what we can achieve today. A great deal of effort has, and I know, I think Representative Inglis is here talking about a CO2 tax. Um, certainly one, at least conceptual way to, 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 to even the playing field is to um, put some sort of a, a tax on CO2 emissions. But again, in, unless that were to be done globally, um, it would have very little impact. 
uh, and in fact would just have the effect of putting affordable, reliable electricity even further out of reach for many of the least fortunate people in our world. Um, but I, I, I had a, a slightly different uh, take I, I wanted to start with, having to do with the overall title of the conference. Um, I, some of you may know the, uh, the title, I think, is Conservative Visions of Our Energy Future. And uh, the, the title actually makes me a little bit nervous because I, I'm not sure there is um, a conservative vision of our energy future. I, I know that there are, and again, I don't want to use pejoratives here, but there certainly are progressive visions of our energy future. And that vision tends to be, first of all, we consume much less energy, um, and whether you do that by increasing the overall cost, whether you do it by um, creating incentives or mandates for energy conservation, but, but that progressive vision is less energy, and to the extent possible, that energy would be from uh, wind power, from solar power, from other types of renewables. I think there are many people on the, who view themselves as environmental liberals um, who assume, since they have a vision of the energy future, that the conservative vision must be exactly the opposite. And so people assume, because I identify myself as a conservative, that somehow my vision must be coal and oil and natural gas and nuclear. Um, uh, but, but I don't think that's a conservative vision at all. Um, as I say, I consider myself to be a true conservative or, uh, or historically maybe more accurate to say a classical liberal. A and, and I really do believe, as Nick said, that the, that the best way, not only for the United States, but for the world to ensure uh, the prosperity of humankind and our planet is to uh, put in place the, the, the basic framework that will allow um, the free market and free enterprise and creative innovators to flourish. And, and, and so I guess, as I was thinking about this topic, I think there's a difference between having a vision for what you think the energy future should look like um, uh, on the one hand, and then a different future where you say what we should be doing is putting in place the basic framework uh, that will allow the energy future to be created in the most effective possible way. Um, and, but, but I think it's really important to think about this structure, this framework that we ought to be putting in place. And um, uh, again, as a classical liberal, um, uh, I, I tend to start from the view that uh, smaller government has historically shown, had been shown, I think, to be more effective uh, at preserving freedoms, at ensuring economic prosperity. But, but one of the things that I like about practicing environmental law as a true conservative is there is a reason for the government to be involved in environmental protection. Um, any of you who had an Economics 101 class will recognize this basic concept that uh, the free market tends to work very well as long as the full costs of, the, of an activity are borne by the actor. And when that actor is able to externalize some of those costs on society by producing pollution, whether it's water pollution or air pollution, um, then we end up with, with outcomes that are clearly uh, uh, inefficient and less desirable from society's perspective. So, so clearly, um, anybody who believes in small government, uh, as, as I do, still believes that an important role of government is to make sure that uh, there is no tragedy of the commons and that actors who are uh, out pursuing their own best interest are not allowed to trample on the best interests of the, of the rest of us. Um, and so there obviously is an important role for the, the, the government, including the federal government, in dealing with environmental issues. And the other issue that, that I think we all need to acknowledge is, at least in this country, the federal government has an enormous role to play because of the ownership of resources and lands, especially in the western United States, where the vast majority of lands that contain energy resources, whether you're looking at solar or wind or fossil fuels, is owned by the federal government. And so there's no doubt that there is an important role. But I think that role should be um, uh, to, to, 
to establish the, the, the principles and, as, as I said before, this framework that will allow the private market to work efficiently and effectively. And um, I guess one of the, one of the <laughs> things that has increasingly frustrated me over the last few years is in our collective efforts to achieve our environmental goals, we have completely ignored some of the things um, that really have provided the foundation of our country in terms of free enterprise and the rule of law. And uh, I've actually been working for, for a, a little while now on a, on a paper on environmentalism and the rule of law. And, and those of you who are interested, as I know many of you are law students, I do encourage you to think about uh, the way the environmental movement has evolved in recent years um, to the point where it no longer really adopts the rule of law as we've conceived it in our country. And let me just give you an example of this. And there's, if you go out there and, 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 uh, and do a little research, you'll see that there are various different definitions of what the rule of law is, what it means, but at, at kind of at its heart, it comes from this idea that that none of us as individuals, as businesses, should be subject to the whims of the government. Uh, that there shouldn't be arbitrary decisions. That you should know, as you're making decisions about your own life, um, what the rules are going to be. Uh, and so you, you know what the rules are, you know what the standards are, and as long as you conform your behavior and your activities to their standards, you, you know that that will be acceptable and the government won't interfere with you. Um, uh, unfortunately, um, our system has kind of slowly and surely evolved away from that. And I, I don't mean to be too political, but I will be especially critical of the, of, of the Obama EPA, which literally from the first week of the administration fundamentally changed the permitting process that applies throughout the country, and in particular under the Clean Air Act. for. Uh, uh, for many years, actually going back to 1977, there has been a federal permitting program for clean air permits. And some of you know about the New Source Review Program, which is also called the PSD Program. But anyone who wants to build any new significant energy facility or manufacturing or industrial facility needs one of these permits. And since 1977, that was a pretty predictable process. And certainly there were uh, there were challenges and there were controversies, but the basic rules were pretty well understood and pretty well set and didn't really change from one administration to the next as we went through a variety of changes. Um, but uh, uh, there were some ominous signals in my mind early on that that was no longer going to be the case because within the first week of taking office, uh, Lisa Jackson quietly set out a, a memo uh, to all of the regional offices, which was then sent to all of the state permitting agencies, saying that, that, that certain things about the permitting process would now be changed. And so people who had been in the permitting process, in some case for several years, and who were about to get the permits, were told that they would have to go back again and play by a different set of rules. Uh, and this particular example had to do with something called PM 2.5, but they, they went from a very predictable rule that had been in place since the Clinton administration that everybody understood, but said, you know what, you now need to go back and do it in a different way. And that way was never fully explained. The idea was you would have to go in and deal with your regional modeler to see whether you were going to violate a PM 2.5 standard. Um, that was only the first of many changes that took place. And the, the, by, by really moving, and, and I, I don't have enough time to go over several other examples, but I, I do want to go, <laughs> I do want to talk about one in particular, which I, which I find really profoundly disturbing. Um, uh, there's a, 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 an energy project probably none of you have ever heard of. In, in my world, it's kind of important, but it's known as the Desert Rock Energy Facility. And this was uh, a project that was conceived and developed by the Navajo Nation. Uh, the Navajo Nation is not blessed with a lot of natural resources, but they, they do own land where there is a, uh, a, a lot of good coal resources. And as a matter of their own economic development, 
had gone out and sought developers that would build a coal-fired power plant on Navajo lands and would use coal from an adjacent coal mine. And as I say, this was a, a project that I became aware of many years after it began, but it was initiated by the Navajo Nation. And the direct payments from that mine and the plant, not, not including the salaries to workers and everything else, but the direct payments of that project uh, would have provided roughly 35% of the total government revenue for the Navajo Nation. So it was a very big deal for them, something they'd been working on by the time I became aware of it for about six years. They'd gone through, they had finally managed to get all of their permits and approvals, including a permit near the end of the, the Bush administration uh, for a, a clean air permit. And uh, uh, when the new administration came in, uh, they sent a notice saying that they wanted to withdraw the permit. Um, and there was actually some, some people within EPA who were a little upset because they had been involved in, uh, 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 in this process. They believed the permit was legally issued. It met all standards. They had you know, their names and all the permitting documents. And so as a result of this internal deliberation, uh, uh, there, there was a document produced that said, you know, the administrator, Lisa Jackson, understands that this is, uh, th that this permit uh, meets all its legal requirements, uh, it, uh, uh, and it, all the procedural safeguards have been followed over the last number of years, but she would just like the opportunity to review this permit uh, under her own policy preferences. And uh, so that permit was withdrawn, and, and this is where I got involved because I talked to the, to the project developer and said, this is clearly illegal. That's not the way our system works. There are laws. She can certainly change those prospectively, but she can't pull a permit that's already been done. And uh, they went in to meet with Lisa Jackson and came back and said, you know what? You're right. We think we can win this lawsuit. But she's made it pretty clear that there's not going to be any coal-fired power plant. And, uh, you know, it would be great. We could win your lawsuit. We could get this permit. But that wouldn't help us with the, with the NEPA approval that we still need from the Bureau of, of, uh, of Indian Affairs or the Endangered Species Act consultation that we still need. So we can continue to spend good money after bad, or we can just go away. Um, Th that, that didn't seem to me to be the way our system works. And yet, that's one big example, but there are many other examples out there where, uh, as a result of the decisions made in the last few years, uh, there is enormous discretion vested in permitting authorities. And depending on the policy preferences of, uh, of whoever ever the regional administrator is or the local state permitting official, they can uh, allow you to build a, a plant uh, or not allow you to build the plant. And there's, in essence, <laughs> um, we are back to a point where uh, the rule of law matters much less than the policy preferences of a local permitting authority. And, and in many cases, uh, the, the, the answer that comes back from people who want to build things is, well, uh, you know, there, there is local opposition to what you want to build, so why don't you sit down with the local neighborhood group or the, or the national environmental group who's challenging your project and see if you can't work something out. And if you work something out with them, well, then we can give you the permit. Th that's, that's not... Um, the way the law is supposed to work, according to my understanding. And, and I think it's something that has been a very significant drag on any kind of energy or industrial development. And in fact, I can tell you the number of permits issued uh, over the last couple of years is roughly about a tenth the number that has been issued on average. Um, I would like to make one other observation and, and, and then uh, look forward to, to questions for, for both of us. There's, there's one other aspect to our environmental law that actually um, I, I find troubling, and that is uh, th th there, are, there are various legal requirements that come from environmental law that cannot be met. Um, and just one example is some of you follow the Clean Air Act, and that's the statute that I'm mostly familiar with. Uh, there was a decision by the Supreme Court um, that said in setting national ambient air quality standards, 
uh, uh, EPA have to set them based solely on its view of what the health sciences are, and they can't consider costs, nor can they even consider whether the standards are achievable. Um, now, the Supreme Court never considered the following question, but it's a question that arises because now there are parts of the country, uh, including most famously probably Southern California, that have a legal requirement that everybody knows they cannot meet. Um, and again, this is not a matter of technology forcing. This is, it's, it's the fact of the matter is anybody who knows about um, the situation in Southern California with the natural conditions, um, they have a legal requirement to do something that they can't do. Um, and as the air quality standards have gotten lower, it's not just Southern California. Uh, it's other parts of the country as well. And so there are various state and local governments that now have a legal obligation to do something that they can't do. And, and this, this tends to make um, the role of government and industry and, and local activists very different because the, 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 the actors know that this standard can't be met. Um, and so the, there really becomes, again, kind of a negotiation between the local environmental groups uh, and the government as to how far they will push people. And a few years ago, actually more than a few years ago now, the environmentalists insisted on uh, no drive days in Southern California. This goes back before many of your times. And that was something that was beyond the pale. And so uh, very quickly, Congress changed the Clean Air Act to say, well, you still have to meet the standards, but you can't do it in this particular way. And so the environmental community in Southern California has learned how far to push uh, with, without, um, uh, without crossing that line. But the rule of law means essentially nothing because the law, as everybody can see, cannot be met. And I, I just think that that should be troubling for anybody who believes that um, our country is based on the rule of law. Uh, so I, I encourage you all to think about um, uh, our, our, our energy future, our environmental future, but to also think about the role that, uh, that the government can appropriately play and the role that the rule of law should play. So thank you very much. Thanks, Jeff. We have a ridiculous number of amazing questions, so you guys, you guys really stepped up. Um, we're going to actually run this panel 10 minutes long since we started 10 minutes late, so we're going to have some good time for questions. Um, the first one comes from Reich Longus from the Duke Environmental Law and Policy Clinic. Um, and this kind of gets to the heart of the matter with climate. So how do you propose to address climate change? If free market and free enterprise could solve this problem without government restrictions, why is it not done so? Is this a problem? Is this problem too big to be touched by small government? And we'll start with uh, Jeff. Uh, I think the answer is yes. The problem is too big to be solved by government right now. But if the problem is going to be solved, it's going to be solved by science and technology. Uh, and so, you know, whether or not we have clean air restrictions and whether or not we ban coal-fired power plants in the United States, as EPA has recently done. The, that makes people feel, feel good if you're an environmental activist in the United States, but, it, it, but what it accomplishes in terms of actually addressing the problem is, is minuscule and potentially counterproductive. If what you do is drive up the cost of energy in the United States so that uh, industries that are dependent on energy have no choice but to locate elsewhere. Um, so I, I think the, the answer, given, given the state of technology today, I, I don't think we can uh, reduce CO2 emissions by 80% before 2050. It's just, it's not going to happen. Yep, I would agree. And just to follow up that, I think, uh, as I mentioned at the end of my talk, I think the best insurance uh, against climate extremes is, is to simply uh, grow these countries economically. And uh, you can look at the, the earthquake in Haiti and the Dominican Republic. There was a, a lot more damage in Haiti than there was the DR. Uh, and, and that was largely because uh, DR, the per capita income and per capita GDP, is, is much higher than that of Haiti. So um, growing these countries economically uh, will help them have better, uh, stronger buildings and, and 
make them more uh, able to adapt uh, and, and protect against these uh, extreme weather events that may or may, that will continue to occur uh, whether we stop anthropogenic warming or not. So to, to follow up on that, is there no role government should play in climate change at the moment? Should we um, take a hands-off approach completely to the climate change issue and just encourage the free market to um, increase energy production? I'll let you go first. Uh, yeah, I would think so, uh, uh, especially given the fact that uh, what, what Jeff mentioned and, and what I mentioned is that uh, a lot of the times when, when the government gets involved, uh, it tends to do much more harm than good. And uh, again, pricing carbon dioxide emissions or, or having any type of unilateral approach, uh, again, is, is not going to do anything to solve the problem. And, and I think we can do a lot in, in, terms, in, in terms of opening up trade barriers uh, and things like that, that that will help other countries grow economically. Uh, I think that, again, is a, a much better way uh, for the government to get involved uh, than trying to, to use a regulatory approach to, to reduce carbon emitting fossil fuels. I, 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 think, it's, I think it's very hard for, for anybody who cares about an issue um, to concede that, that, that maybe that issue is beyond their ability to, to solve. Uh, and I, I don't mean to be defeatist about it, but I, I, I do think there are many things that the government can do. Um, adaptation is something that people are thinking about, uh, uh, not only in the United States, but around the world. I, I think there are clear reasons to believe that we can be more energy efficient. Um, and one of the reasons we're not is because of the, the, the market failures that are inherent in kind of our basic structure today, and, and we ought to try to deal with those so people have an incentive to use energy more efficiently. But, but it doesn't matter. I mean, unless we're prepared to engage in military action to keep development from happening and bombing coal-fired power plants that are coming up um, on average of about one a week in China, we're not going to solve the, the problem. And we, we could impose significant costs on ourselves and our consumers. And those of us in this room are probably going to be okay generally, but, but people who are at the lower end of the economic spectrum in the United States are the people who suffer the most when the price of energy goes up. Um, so I, I do think there are things we can do, and I think at some point I'm not sure I agree that pricing carbon dioxide isn't, isn't a good idea. If we could do that globally, if we could get a global enforceable price on carbon dioxide, but, but otherwise what you're going to end up doing is just moving heavy industry around from one place to the other, and, unless you're willing to, to impose all kinds of you know, border controls that would clearly be economically destructive. So following up on that, there's a bunch of questions that touch something similar, but if we could create a carbon tax that had a multilateral or universal applicability, would that be something that we would want to do? If, even if it wasn't just within the United States, if we could make this um, apply more globally? Well, again, I, <laughs> it's probably a good thing I'm never running for public office. <laughs> um, <laughs> as a matter of theory, what we would want to do is, is do our best to determine the true social cost of carbon and set uh, a, a tax that's equal to that. That would be the most efficient way of dealing with this problem. I don't think anybody would disagree. Um, however, the, the, there's enormous uncertainty over as to what the true social cost of carbon is. Um, uh, I think it, under the Obama administration, the official number is $21 a ton. And there's a number of people in the environmental movement who think that's far too low. Um, uh, but, but the one thing I can say is if it is $21 a ton, um, that's not enough to, to save the planet if you believe that to save the planet we've got to reduce it by 80%. Because even at $21 a ton, if that's the optimal price to put on carbon, uh, y y you make many things more expensive, you do use less energy. But CO2 emissions continue to go up under every model that I've seen. So I think the idea that we would establish a tax equal to the social cost of carbon is the right way to go, but only if, if it could be implemented globally. Otherwise, you just create all kinds of distortions. 
Yeah, and just to follow up on that, I mean, I would say no, not at this point. I mean, to borrow a phrase from my colleague, David Kreutzer, he says a carbon tax is the most humane way to execute an innocent person. And I think what he, he means by that is because there is so much uncertainty as to what's driving climate change, uh, what the social costs of climate change and greenhouse gas emissions are, um, what the positive externalities may be from, from living in a warmer world, um, coupling all of that with uh, highly erratic climate change models that are essentially driving uh, what the projected social costs uh, or maybe benefits might be because there's that so much uh, differing opinions on, on what the, the science is. And it really wasn't that long ago. It was only 40 years ago when Time Magazine had uh, a cover that warned about the next uh, global ice age. And people were suggesting that we need to cover the, the polar ice caps in black soot to create a warming effect to, to prevent the, the next uh, next climate freeze. So the fact that there's just so much scientific uncertainty over this issue, uh, to me, I think it would be hasty to implement any type of carbon tax right now. Well, the, the fact that both you guys acknowledge the issue at all is it's a big step forward. And then we have, um, <laughs> at least from the bumper sticker land that we touched on at the beginning, um, a lot of questions that really get at the next issue that arises not from climate, but from an economic standpoint. And the one that I think hits it most on the head is from Adam Berkland at Duke Law School. Is there a market failure that justifies government intervention to subsidize green or clean energy? Put another way, does the free market have sufficient incentives to produce a big leap in, in energy technology that, could, that would be price competitive with fossil fuels? Or, in the alternative, how can we gain traction around eliminating subsidies for fossil fuels? But we'll start with the um, market failure. Is there a market failure that justifies government intervention at all in green energy? I can start. Um, I don't. It, it, obviously, fossil fuels um, produce, produce negative externalities uh, in, in terms of pollution. Setting aside carbon dioxide, you know, if you talk about black carbon and, and other things, um, but I don't think you internalize a negative externality by subsidizing other sources of energy. I think you internalize those externalities. How, how, how about if you subsidize it and mandate it? How about that? <laughs> yeah, that might work, um, but. You can ask the ethanol producers and the environmentalists that, that aren't too happy with the ethanol mandate about that. Uh, so I don't think, I think a much more productive approach getting to the second half of that question would be removing those subsidies uh, for the fossil fuel industry because there's plenty of, of subsidies, uh, tax credits for the fossil industry, um, clean coal subsidies. There's a lot of money in the Department of Energy that uh, researches uh, drilling of unconventional fossil fuels and unconventional oil. I think that all can be done uh, within the private sector. So um, removing those subsidies, I think, would be a great step forward uh, in terms of, uh, I guess, leveling the playing field, for lack of a better term. And we also can't forget that it's not the wild, wild west out there. A lot of these companies can't pollute uh, because of acts like the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act. And we've gotten to a point where we're regulating it to the next part per billion, where the diminishing marginal returns of reducing that uh, pollution, uh, whether it may be unachievable uh, or it may be so small and insignificant, and the costs are extremely high. So we, I think we need to take that into consideration as well. This is a, a discussion when I was at EPA that we, we had with staff. And the, the question that I asked was, okay, what, what is it about renewable energy that makes it, that, that, that makes it something we ought to be subsidizing or promoting? And um, the, the only real issue that, that often came up was, well, it is the most, you know, that's a way we can deal with CO2 because renewable, and, and you know, there's also traditional pollutants, but there seems to be general acknowledgement that, that, uh, that subsidizing other forms of energy isn't the best way to deal with that. If it's all about CO2, numerous studies have shown that there are, you, you know, whether or not you think it's a good idea, mandating or subsidizing specific technologies like wind and solar is an extremely inefficient and expensive way of doing it, um, as countries around the world are finding. I mean, it's, it's one of the things that I like to, to, to point out, and I follow a fair about what's going on with the renewable energy debate in Europe, is, you know, when countries were giving generous subsidies for a little bit of energy, that could be spread, uh, and the cost of which could be spread across an economy, 
it, it made people feel good uh, that they were doing something. But as people have taken advantage of those subsidies, and the amount of wind and solar, especially in Spain and Portugal and Germany, has expanded, they become enormously expensive to the extent to which they make a real difference in the average person's power bill. And it, it's just no longer economically sustainable to, to do that. So uh, I, now I, I do believe the government has a role to do in terms of basic research. And I'm not exactly sure where we draw that line, but there are negative externalities with all forms of energy production, including solar and wind and geothermal, and but especially fossil fuels. Um, I, I think it makes sense for the government to engage in the kind of um, you know, DARPA approach that people are talking about because the market doesn't do a very good job at pursuing those things. But the problem is w we've spent an awful lot of money um, subsidizing technologies on the promise they, that they were about to become cost competitive. We just keep it for five more years, for ten more years. Um, and as a result, we've, we've, we've wasted an awful lot of taxpayer money. And just to quickly add on, I think one of the other things uh, the government can do is to reduce the, the regulatory burden that, that's coming down on a lot of these smaller renewable projects because uh, if they're held up in unnecessary litigation or, or regulation um, because they're smaller projects and, and might have a, a thinner margin uh, of profit, it can drive them to be uncompetitive. And the United States Chamber of Commerce has this website called Project No Project where they talk about all of the energy projects in the United States that are held up uh, for one reason or another, and over half of them uh, are renewable energy projects. Um, and just a quick follow-up. Mr. Holmes, would you agree with uh, Mr. Olaris that we should create a level playing field and eliminate the subsidies on more conventional fuels and just eliminate all government subsidies in general? Oh, absolutely, yes. Right. No, I, I, th I think we're at a point now where there really should be a level playing field. Now, I, I, I know enough <laughs> to know that different people have uh, uh, different points of view about what is a subsidy and what is not, and uh, uh, and, I, and again, I, I don't know a whole lot about the petroleum industry, but, but the claim that they have is that what is being called a, a subsidy by the environmental community is in fact a tax treatment that's like any other business gets. So I don't, I don't know what the answer is in terms of where you draw the line, but, but I absolutely agree that... But it's definitely a conversation yeah, worth I, having. And I can chime in on that a little bit. Um, a, a lot of the, the billions of dollars that uh, is claimed that the oil companies get is largely due to a, a manufacturing tax credit uh, that, that's broadly available for all manufacturers. Uh, it's so broad that the, even the New York Times gets it because they, they manufacture a newspaper and it's available to all renewable projects as well. And uh, even the, the oil and gas companies are punished uh, on that manufacturing uh, tax credit. They only get to take a 6% deduction while everybody else takes a 9% deduction. The ones that are really excluded from it uh, are, are the service sector, the restaurants, and things like that. If you want to scrap the tax code and, and rehaul that, that's one conversation. But I think it is a little bit disingenuous to talk about some of the oil subsidies uh, that these companies get that aren't necessarily targeted subsidies. Well, thanks. There's some amazing questions here that we're not going to get to, but we will ask the speakers to follow up in the, the issue of Duke Environmental Law and Policy Forum we publish. I want to thank uh, Jeff Homestead and Nick Loris for all their time, and great job, guys. So we're going to have another panel before lunch, and um, both of our speakers are going to be using PowerPoint, and we'll have Jessa Lee Landfried handle both the introductions and question and answer. So I'm going to load up the first PowerPoint, and Jess Lee will do the introduction. Hi everyone, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, our next panel is a Greening the Planet, Cutting the Budget, and our first speaker on the panel will be Eli Lehrer. Um, Eli is president and co-founder of the R Street Institute, which is a national think tank supporting free markets and limited effective government. Prior to co-founding R Street, he was the vice president of the Heartland Institute. 
He's variously served as a Heritage Foundation Fellow, as a speechwriter for Senate Majority Leader Bill Frist, and as a Senior Editor of American Enterprise Magazine. Um, thanks so much for joining us. I'd like to welcome Eli Lehrer. We're having slight te technical difficulties on the PowerPoint at the moment. Um, it says it's up. So. Thank you very much, Cecily, for that introduction. And thank you, David, uh, for putting all this together. Thank you to both of you. Thank you also to Nick and to Jeff for terrific presentations that I agree with and were very good. With that, let me start my PowerPoint. All right, thank you so much for having me here today and thank you for putting on this forum. Once again, thanks so much to David and to Jessely for putting this together. Today, my presentation is Saving the Earth, Shrinking the State. I'd like to talk about ways that we can work towards a better, cleaner environment for everybody and a smaller, more limited, more effective government. Let me begin then by talking a little bit about my organization and some stuff that we like. Milton Friedman, John Stuart Mill, Frederick von Hayek, Frederick Douglass, and freedom in general. We like freedom very much. That's something we like. We are a libertarian organization. We are part of the right, but we are part of the practical right, the practical-minded right. Here is something we dislike, red tape. Here's something we really hate, Snooky. <laughs> so, here's where I'll start. There are plenty of people on the right, including many of my former colleagues, who believe that this is essentially the left-wing vision of conservation, being cavemen and cavewomen, reverting to a Neolithic existence. And I have to be honest, this is a stereotype that some on the right hold. But equally silly stereotypes are held on the left. There are people, and I know some of them, my father among them, in fact, who believe that basically the right desires pollution above all else and actually actively desires a destroyed environment. Obviously, neither of these things are true. We can all see that. And we can already talk about some places where there are things that both the left and the right can like. Here's one good example. 
This is Project City Center in Las Vegas. At the time of its completion, it was the largest private construction project in the United States period. It's an enormous complex, spectacular. Slot machines, gourmet restaurants, scantily clad casino waitresses, everything. It's also, it's also the largest LEED certified development in the country. It uses less water than a medium-sized hotel, probably less water than the hotel I stayed at last night, despite being in the middle of the desert. And it uses less energy than a medium-sized office building. And it's one of the largest hotels in the country. This is an example of the free market for practical profit-driven reasons, for the most part, working for a better environment. Here's another example. This is a coastal barrier island, and it's part of my favorite environmental conservation effort, the Coastal Barrier Resources Act. This law, signed in 1983, is, I think, the best environmental law we have on the books. It's a very simple law. It says that when it comes to coastal barrier islands and barrier beaches, extremely important natural resources, people who own them privately can do whatever they want. They can pave them and build Disney World if they want to. But the federal government does not and will not provide a single dollar in subsidies through 53 different programs and the National Flood Insurance Program. The result is that we virtually stop development along the designated areas in the Coastal Barrier Resources System. And collectively, the Coastal Barrier Resources System comprises an area of protected land larger than all but one national park in the lower 48 states. And all of this conservation, all of this benefit to the environment, has saved taxpayers more than $1 billion. The cost is zero, and the savings are enormous, and the benefit to the environment is enormous. Today, then, I'll talk about three things. A way that groups in the left, center, and right came together around a consensus for ways to cut government while helping the environment. Second, ways that I feel we could go even further in advancing these goals. Finally, a brief discussion of why smaller government often not always, but quite often, equals a better environment. Let's start with Green Scissors. This is the Green Scissors report. It's been issued for over 15 years. It was created originally by the liberal environmental group Friends of the Earth. I don't, I don't think they would mind at all being called progressive, left-wing, leftist, and probably wouldn't even object that much if I said they were commies. Friends of the Earth has joined with the centrist, and they really are centrist, budget watchdog, taxpayers for common sense, and my group, R Street, a conservative think tank, to produce this report. The report is premised on some basic facts that I think almost nobody can dispute. Government is by far our largest employer. It also buys more stuff. It's the biggest consumer. And boatloads of government programs, not only in the environmental realm, but elsewhere, subsidize things we just shouldn't subsidize. The report then divides government spending into five basic categories where environmental harm is possible. Energy, agriculture, transportation, insurance, my own specialty, and public lands and water. Let me go over each of these in order. Energy. This is my favorite. As everybody in this room knows extremely well, the oil industry is a small, minor one that does not produce large profits, and furthermore, needs support from taxpayers to do things that it otherwise couldn't do. Therefore, we have some general purpose tax credits. We also have a particular tax credit when you open a new oil well. This is something we really need because there just isn't demand for oil generally. We have ag policies that literally provide extra subsidies for planting on the most highly erodible land. Why would we possibly do this? I 
have a very good farm subsidy proposal that consists of a blank sheet of paper and has no farm subsidies whatsoever. At minimum, we should not subsidize erosion. But we, and you, do. We have this lovely program called the Essential Air Service Program. This provides tick subsidies of up to $200 per plane ticket to fly into airports where the private sector doesn't want to fly. These flights are rarely any faster than buses. They create enormous amounts of pollution. And this was a temporary program designed to help for a few years while we worked out the kinks of airline deregulation in 1979. Then we have great programs so that you too can have a federally subsidized beach house. If you have a beach house, the federal government will suppress insurance rates like crazy so you can have affordable flood insurance and live in a flood zone. This is just a, a lovely idea. Now this is a place where the coalition, a, a similar left-right coalition, has actually made some progress. Working with the three member organizations and other groups like National Wildlife Federation, Americans for Tax Reform, the Competitive Enterprise Institute. Congress recently passed and President Obama signed the most significant reforms to the flood insurance program since the program's creation in its current form in 1973. This reform is not perfect, it doesn't fix everything. But it certainly moves the program for the first time, really ever, in the right direction. But there's more damage. But there's more damage the government does too. One very good example is through our water projects, through the Army Corps of Engineers, the Mr. Go Waterway, Mississippi River Gulf Coast Outlet Waterway that you see here was built. This is a government subsidized program used typically this waterway, to transport a single boatload of frozen chickens to Russia. The waterway allowed in a much more intense storm surge that probably increased by 30 to 40 percent the amount of damage done to New Orleans because we built a waterway that basically was designed to encourage more water to come into New Orleans if there was a storm surge. The waterway is finally being closed, fortunately. The Green Scissors agenda, however, important as it is, it is enthusiastically as I support it, is not a complete agenda. There were issues where the diversity of the coalition simply did not allow us to agree. Friends of the Earth believes that government subsidies for biotechnology and genetic engineering are harmful. I believe, on balance, they are quite helpful to the environment. As a result, they're not in the proposal. Likewise, there are things that I believe are harmful that Friends of the Earth was not convinced of, and there are also things that may be helpful to the environment, but still are bad ideas. For example, the result is that you end up with a broader vision elimination of all energy subsidies, repeal of regulations, and prices rather than regulations on pollution. So let me get to an example. I think that a very large number of people on the left as well as the right can agree pretty easily that the idea of subsidizing many of these green energy programs is awful. I love the illustration that Nick gave of the Venn diagram, and I couldn't agree with that more. Things like Solyndra, why should the government subsidize product development at all, of any sort? On the other hand, we also have subsidies for strip mining coal. If something is viable, that's exactly the reason not to subsidize it. The thought that I have is that we should move towards a system that relies on prices determined as well as we can, rather than these burdensome regulations. Certainly there's a role for regulation, but quite often a price mechanism of some sort can work better 
and result in smaller, less intrusive government, rather than a regulation. Sometimes this will work. The environment does have tremendous advantages, tremendous power, tremendous economic value by itself. Many free market policies will often improve the environment. Sometimes, many times, most times I would posit, simply getting the government out of the way is the solution for the environment. Sometimes free market policies are better. True, they aren't always better. This is one of my favorite natural areas, Isle Royale in, in Lake Superior. This is a beautiful, isolated, rugged island, preserved entirely as a national park. It would be a fantastic place to build summer houses and luxury resorts. Those things aren't there because we've preserved it as a park. Economically, I'm not sure if you could really justify it. I think the land probably would have more value in private hands. But there is an existence value that we must acknowledge and indeed must be placed as a value that is thought about and dealt with in one way or another. There is a way for environmentalists and those who believe in free markets to work together. Let me quote my hero, my favorite president, the greatest president, Ronald Reagan. Many laws protecting environmental quality have promoted liberty by securing property against the destructive trespass of pollution. That's from one of his reports from the Council for Environmental Quality. And I think it contains some very important ideas. First, it recognizes in a way many on the environmental left do not, that there is a strong and important link between liberty, environmental protection, and private property. Second, it realizes that pollution, the damage to the environment, does hurt all of us. It is a trespass. It is a violation of property rights. And it is something that in one way or another must be confronted by the public sector. Disagreements between free market and environmental forces are necessary. Indeed, they should exist. There are cases where environmental values and those of the free market must clash. They should. But conservatism has a lot of important things to say about the environment. Conservatism properly understood can be green, and conservatism properly understood should be green. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Eli. Um, our next speaker on this panel uh, is Jeremy Carl. Jeremy Carl is a research fellow at the Hoover Institution and research director for Hoover's Schultz Stevenson Task Force on Energy Policy. Before coming to Hoover, Carl was a research fellow at the Program on Energy and Sustainable Development at the Freeman Spogli Institute of International Studies at Stanford. His work has appeared in numerous popular and scholarly journals, including the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, The Economist, San Francisco Chronicle, and Newsweek. He's advised and assisted numerous groups, including the World Bank, the United Nations, and the staff of the US Congress. Um, and I'd like to also remind everyone that our ushers are going up and down the aisle to collect questions. So if you have any, please feel free to pass them along. Uh, thank you, Jeremy. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me. Um, so I've titled this talk, No Turning Back, Dismantling the, Dismantling the Fantasies of Liberal Environmentalism and Cutting the Budget Too. Um, those of you, uh, maybe a couple in the audience, may actually recognize this is actually a reference to a very interesting book uh, that was written by Wallace Kaufman, who is a summa cum laude graduate of this university, uh, and was actually uh, an environmental leader and a kind of a deep ecologist, still is actually, for, for 20 plus years here in North Carolina. Now is living out in the wilderness in Oregon. And he wrote a book called No Turning Back uh, that I'll talk a little bit more about later. 
but uh, I think was really kind of a fa one of the most fascinating, and he's not a conservative, he's not a partisan, as far as I know, he's still a deep ecologist living out in Oregon, but when it really one of the most fascinating critiques of mainstream environmentalism that I think has been done. So I was talking with my wife a little bit about uh, what I was going to say here, and I said, well, you know, this is kind of like it's a liberal group, and I'm used to that because I'm at Stanford, but, but it's, you know, it's always a little bit nervous, and, and, and you know, I was sort of wondering what strategy I should use to, uh, to talk, and she sort of said, well, you know, just kind of lead with your toughest point to make first, like the one that's going to really challenge the audience most, and then, you know, over time after that, everything will, will kind of look better for you. Um, so with that spirit in mind, um, the toughest fact first is I'm a Tar Heel. Uh, I'm from Chapel Hill. This is my little boy. You can't see the, uh, so well in the picture, but he's uh, wearing, or one of my little boys, he's uh, wearing a shirt that says, I've already learned that North Carolina is better than Duke, a little greater than symbol. Um, a little quote from Winston Churchill to that uh, effect. Um, <laughs> So in any case, uh, I, I'm a little bit of an unlikely critic of uh, liberal environmentalism demographically. Uh, I live in the Bay Area. I actually do drive a Prius. I didn't even bring that out. I'd, if I did have a bumper sticker on it, there'd be the most fantastic far right wing stuff though. It would really probably blow people's minds, but I, I just don't put bumper stickers on my cars. Uh, I'm actually a former staffer at the Environmental Defense Fund, which is a, a kind of major uh, uh, environmental group that is, is generally considered on the center left. Um, named one of my sons after a national park. Uh, and uh, my oldest son went on a backpacking trip at three weeks. My middle son spent uh, his first weekend in Yosemite at 11 days old. And even most radically, I once hiked through Anwar for 10 days without even once thinking of drilling for oil there. So, uh, you know, I, on demographically, uh, you wouldn't necessarily expect that I would be uh, critiquing uh, environmentalism. And in fact, perhaps uh, somebody's favorite president, just a little, might, might look at that and say, well, shut up, hippie. Um, but in fact, uh, not so much. And before I kind of get into my critique of, of uh, liberal environmentalism, just let me, in, in the spirit of fairness, say as a conservative environmental uh, confession, I think at its worst, uh, parts of the conservative movement can fall prey to materialism. I think left is, is kind of an entirely materialist ideology, often philosophically, but that's, a, that's a, another point entirely, and a sort of reflexive hostility to environmentalism. Um, sometimes that hostility is deserved, I just don't think it should be reflexive. Um, uh, some conservatives are exceptionally, excessively friendly to large polluting businesses, especially if they're major employers in a particular area. I think that's often, often true of even the quote unquote more liberal uh, politicians from those same areas, but I think it's fair to point out. And I think just like all political groups, sometimes conservatives oppose things for the sake of opposing. So I offer that self-critique in, in a spirit of fairness kind of before I get into eviscerating uh, the, the rest of it. And yet we, we have a situation in which most of our landmark environmental legislation in this country has been enacted by Republicans. Creation of the EPA under Nixon, enactment of the Clean Water Act, also Nixon, enactment of the Clean Air Act. Uh, passage of the Montreal Protocol. I work very closely with George Schultz, Ronald Reagan's Secretary of State, still at Hoover, still very active at age 91. We've talked a lot about kind of Reagan's approach to environmental policy, was touched a little bit on by our previous speaker. Uh, Kofi Annan called uh, the Montreal Protocol, which Schultz worked on uh, with, uh, with Reagan quite closely, is perhaps the most successful international agreement to date, period. Not environmental agreement, but agreement. Might be a slight exaggeration, but it's certainly been, I'd argue, the only effective international environmental treaty at a global level. We can talk about why in Q&A if people are interested, because I think there's actually some interesting things about innovation and property rights that, that flow from that. And we had TR uh, as the dramatic expansion of the national park system, and, and perhaps uh, for that reason we find, uh, not unsurprisingly, that in a major uh, survey of environmental groups, uh, two Republicans, TR and Nixon, were uh, ranked as the top environmental presidents. But we seem to have moved away from that. So how in the world did we, we move away from a, a sort of more bipartisan uh, sort of approach to these things? Well, I think there are two, two sort of things. I call them the two big Cs. There's climate change and there's complicity. Let me first talk about climate change. First, I think there were a lot of things that happened that have happened in the climate change debate over the last 10 or 15 years that were policy failures that were entirely predictable. There were people like myself in softer voices and people who had bigger pulpits, some of my academic mentors like David Victor with, with, with louder voices, kind of saying this entire Kyoto approach is not going to work. 
there's a variety of reasons why it, it literally can't work. And for people, including a lot of conservatives who offered principled opposition to sort of saying, yeah, you know, let's, let's look about this uh, in, a, in a different way that, that might be more effective, were quite frequently attacked in the most hostile and, and personal terms and accused of uh, not uh, caring about the environment. And had I been important enough at the time to have my picture on the front of the Washington Post, there would have been 50 smokestacks uh, you know, pointing up saying, I'm polluting this or that because I believe in that. I think partially because of that history, the climate wars, and I think climate really has been the big divisive issue that's, that's kind of pulled the sides further apart than substantially than they were, have sort of become culture wars. And, and, and in that, I think uh, kind of carbon credits serve as, as the equivalent of papal indulgences. For those of you who are familiar with your medieval history, the notion of the papal indulgence was that you could essentially pay the pope uh, and some of your sins would be forgiven. This is one of the causes of the uh, Protestant Reformation uh, originally. Uh, I guess sort of, I should say past Middle Ages, more the, the, uh, the Reformation uh, Renaissance period. Um, so I have a, a, a illustration I just sort of drew, uh, and I actually know a lot of liberal environmentalists who've uh, critiqued uh, this kind of notion as well. But I think the problem with it is, is, is to me it's symptomatic of the kind of um, way that certain groups of wealthy people have kind of uh, while not really changing their own lifestyles at all, become very self-righteous about criticizing the lifestyles of others. Uh, and I think, again, the, the, the political impact of that was very corrosive. And then the complicity aspect, again, I, and I apologize just because of the nature of, of the amount of time we have here to talk, I, I'm not really giving, I, I'm making assertions here without necessarily proving them in the context, but I'm just trying to give you my, my kind of views on it. Uh, there was a relative silence from many scholars about a really, a lot of very shoddy left-wing environmentalist claims, uh, mostly made by environmental groups. Um, but in many cases, there has been biased research, just sort of obviously biased research uh, that has contributed to those claims. And so I think that the combination of those two things over, over time has really led to the sides growing apart. Uh, I'll give you an example. I just got this emailed confession this week from a colleague of mine who's an a environmental scholar at a very respected uh, university newly uh, that we've, uh, we've all heard of. I'm going to anonymize this for his uh, protection. But he wrote me and said, I'm seriously defensive here at this, this person's an agricultural economist, I should say, um, and very liberal, at where FAO, the Gates Foundation, and CGIAR, that's a big... Uh, uh, UN-based Agricultural Research Foundation are part of the problem while Campesino and other peasant rights organizations that fo focus on food sovereignty and food security are, are part of uh, the solution. Help, what can you send me that will make me feel like a progressive again? Well, of course, I wrote back to this person and said, well, I don't want you to feel like a progressive. I'd love it if you became a conservative, so I'm not going to help you out, but I do sympathize a little bit with your plight. But I thought that this person's, uh, his, his email to me was kind of indicative of the political pressure that even is placed on fairly, um, I mean, in this case, a quite liberal scholar who's trying to keep some scholarly integrity in a highly politicized academic environment around these issues. Okay, and this was not something I solicited for the purpose of showing in a PowerPoint. Um, so it's, it's just indicative. Nope. Oh. Sorry, quote, quote from Wallace Kaufman, the, the gentleman who uh, I mentioned at the top of my talk. Uh, over 20 years, the environmental meetings I attend seem more like church meetings. And I think that kind of religious aspect really got into to what I'm talking about here. So given that, what are the solutions? Cutting the budget, greening the planet. Uh, let's talk about California for a second, where I am. Um, we had a really interesting experience here with our state parks. Uh, there was a budget crisis sort of manufactured budget crisis in California. Um, there were threats to close 70 of the 230 or 40 uh, units in the state park system over what was frankly a trivial amount of money in the context of our overall budget. And I think this is interesting because California in many ways, unfortunately, is at the leading edge of a lot of our political and economic trends in this country, demographic trends, et cetera. Um, when push came to shove, massive med welfare, Medicaid programs, public employee unions got tens of billions of dollars. Parks got eventually zero. This entire cut was over $22 million in the California budget. Now, $22 million is not nothing, but in the context of California's budget, it's nothing, especially when you're talking about a basic service such as parks. And I think one thing that liberal environmentalists need to be honest about themselves, in, in Obama's limitless spending world, they don't need to be priorities. It's just like yes to everything. But in California, where we actually have a requirement to balance the budget, 
we ignore it a lot, but, but we can only ignore it to so much of an extent. Um, what happened is a bunch of welfare programs and ridiculous stops to public employee unions were put at the top, and basic services like parks were, were threatened with closure. Um, and uh, this is a picture of me backpacking with a couple of my boys at uh, Henry Coe State Park, which is the second largest park in the state of California, one of them threatened with closure. Um, and uh, we were there just uh, a few months back. Um, and uh, I ended up talking to a gentleman, a very wealthy businessman, who personally ended up writing a, I think what ended up probably being a low seven-figure check to keep this park open. And he's a Romney supporter, actually. He's, a, he's been a Romney donor. And uh, you know, I, we kind of talked about the various dysfunctionalities in California state government that led to this. And he basically said, look, I, I decided not to stand on principle. <laughs> you know, what, really the right principled thing to do would have just been to say, California, you've made your bed with the sort of liberalism you've chosen, now lie in it. But he decided that, you know, he lived kind of near this park. It's actually only an hour from Silicon Valley. It's kind of remarkable. Uh, huge, not, not that visited, but he's put up a bunch of money to, to just keep it minimally staffed with rangers. Um, but we talked about solutions. You know, how could you get around this? How could, because part of the problem that these parks have is they're very underutilized assets by people. And so there's not a big popular constituency for them. So you could do everything, and I'm not suggesting, you know, that we put water rides in the Yellowstone geysers, right? I mean, there's, there's, there's a time and a place for everything appropriately. But, um, you know, backcountry lodges, hut-to-hut -hut hiking. There's some hot springs on this property that, that 100 years ago, this used to all be ranch land, the different ranches. It was never pristine. Um, uh, you know, maybe you could reopen them. Uh, they've sort of fallen into disrepair, improve road access. This type of development and this type of orientation toward access is often hotly contested by more liberal environmental groups. Um, but I think that very much for the future of California state parks, this type of model and public-private partnerships, and at times even just turning the entire things over to private management for some of these parks that are not getting visitation right now, um, I think that this has to be the wave of the future. So another example, uh, some folks have touched on property rights a little bit. Um, the worst environmental abuses happen in countries in which uh, you've had poor property rights, whether China now, I don't know if people may have seen the picture of the uh, uh, the Yangtze flowing red uh, from a few weeks ago, probably because of industrial dye pollution. Uh, Eastern Europe under communism, similarly. Um, and you see this problem is particularly relevant to folks like us out in the West. Um, this, the red pieces here are the uh, percentage that, of land in each of these states that are owned by the government, and you can see this vast chunk, of, the majority of the West is in fact owned by the federal government. This causes a lot of um, a lot of friction with, with uh, local inhabitants. Even 45% of California is owned by the feds. Um, from the Oakland Zoo last weekend, I was with my kids right before I came here, and uh, you know, it said far more tigers in captivity in the U.S. than live in the wild worldwide. Now, there's problems with the way a lot of those captive tigers are kept, but you know, why, are, why are we able to keep them here and not keep them in the wild? Well, I used to live in India. I worked at an environmental energy policy NGO there. I can tell you, it's you've got a corrupt government, and uh, there are people who you know can have a private use to sort of take the tiger's body parts, and there's just a big corrupt bargain where the tiger gets killed. Whereas here, uh, because we have private ownership of those animals, we have an incentive to keep those animals alive. So what you have is extinction in the wild, and where you what you have is successful conservation in many ways, in the U.S. Um, Dan Esty, not a, not a Republican, but a, a Democrat uh, out in Connecticut who's also been an environmental academic, has actually written some interesting stuff and said some interesting things about this. Um, and he talks in terms of a policy toward regulation uh, that I think has to do with property rights but also other things with land. Uh, this goes back to uh, the, some of the comments made by the gentleman from our first panel. Uh, not light regulation but predictable regulation with fair outcomes, fast timelines for decision making, not 15 year processes where things can be sued 15 times, but basic rule of law where people understand what the rules are, they decide whether or not they feel that they can do whatever they would like to do in compliance with the rules and then they move, we move forward. And that doesn't mean that you don't have comment periods, it just means that you don't have these essential violations of due process for people. And so I think those are really essential. Uh, smarter energy investments. Uh, we need more energy R&D, but we need to stop supporting 
technologies that are not cost effective at scale because what happens is as soon as they become big enough to the point that they actually again this was touched on earlier become useful from a contribution of energy standpoint the subsidies just become completely unworkable um, so we need to retrench we need to focus on efficient deployment of resources already out there things like say for the wind farms that we've we've built in this country uh, spending more money on the sorts of computer modeling and simulations that will allow them to run more at baseload, rather than putting new steel in the ground that can't run at baseload. Um, but, but sort of retrenching so that we can actually use some of the stuff that we've already paid to deploy. And we need honest environmental groups, um, and we need to be honest about it, that they're frequently kept from doing the right thing on energy because of donor pressure. I can talk all about that because I've been on the inside of it. Finally, um, we need to embrace new technologies, not just green and trendy ones. Uh, right now, everything is yes but no. I was told this by a leading uh, member of an environmental group, I'll keep anonymous, in terms of their group's attitude toward fracking. And sort of, it's, it's a theoretical yes, but in practical reasons, it's all just gonna be no, no, no. Um, US CO2 emissions, this is just reality, right? They're at a 20-year low from the grid. And why is that? It's really, I mean, there, there's a lot, there's the economy, but really, the primary driver is Hydraulic fracturing, natural gas boon. Um, these groups like Artists Against Fracking, the trendy are not the friends of the earth. Okay, I've talked with, um, I've talked with John Deutsch about this. John Deutsch headed the Department of Energy's, uh, Obama's Department of Energy's report on fracking, that natural gas fracking. I've talked extensively with Mark Zoback about this, who's a colleague at Stanford, uh, so, uh, a, a um, you know, expert in, in as a geologist, uh, one of the world's leading experts on this stuff, and they both agree that based at least on any known risk that we have right now, the cost-benefit analysis, if we think climate is important, suggests that we should be going forward, not, not without regulation, not without, um, not without appropriate safeguards, but that we should be going forward, and yet for donor reasons and for sort of PC reasons, we have environmental groups and groups of artists who honestly wouldn't know a natural gas well from any other hole in the ground, um, kind of coming out with these rather silly statements. So, a plea to liberal environmentalists is to get over yourselves a little bit. Uh, I, again, uh, I quote Wallace Kaufman's book, which I would highly encourage, it's out of print, but uh, you can still get it, and he said, it's become clear to me that we either care about the environmental movement or we care about the environment. And I think that actually kind of crystallizes it quite nicely. Um, nobody likes to be lectured about their lifestyle or consumer choices. Uh, Kaufman tells a story in this book about how he kind of assembled a lot of his uh, colleagues from environmental uh, organizations to, to kind of discuss issues. And at one point, he sort of said, well, well you know, who here has a house under 1,700 square feet, which at least at the time was the average size of American square home, and out of like 15, two. You know, he kind of went through a few other consumption questions. And the bottom line is they just, they weren't, they weren't walking the walk, they were talking the talk. They might have been buying their carbon papal indulgences, but they, they, weren't, they weren't walking the walk. Um, statistically speaking, despite efforts to diversify, the environmental movement is largely still a group of well-off white people. Now, if Republicans are bashing you for being well-off white people, you've got some problems. This is an observation. Um, and, and recognize that particularly in the developing world, again, I can talk about this a lot from my time in India that I, where I was living there, uh, there's been a lot of poverty that has been explicitly created in the name of sustainability. Um, no, it wasn't intentionally created in the name of sustainability, but but people did things because, particularly led by, by Western interests, not usually domestic interests, but, but, uh, but, but funded by Western interests, have, do, have created a lot of poverty through false ideas, in my view, of what is sustainable. Hollywood is the worst messenger for this sort of stuff. Al Gore is the second worst messenger. When you combine them, you're basically begging conservatives to pick a fight with you. Um, and, you know, it just, I don't know if, how many of you have had the misfortune to be at Hollywood parties. Uh, I've done it on a couple occasions. And it's just, I mean, if there's a group of more shallow materialistic people in the world, I have not met them. Um, when I get lectured on morality by people like that, it just like, makes my ears begin to let off steam. Okay? I mean, so having, having bashed everybody, I mean, what, what's the good news here? 
Uh, I'm an optimist on the energy and environment problem. I do think that actually, as was alluded to in an earlier uh, panel, I don't know that we can, I think it, you might have to fill in the bubble right now of cannot be solved with the information given. I'm not sure that we can solve it, particularly on the climate end, with the technologies we have today. But I do think that through a combination of technological innovation and a policy environment that favors the deployment of those innovative technologies, and that doesn't mean subsidizing stuff that ultimately can't scale economically. It means really developing technologies that eventually will be able to scale economically. We can get um, to, to where we need to get. So uh, I'm a short-term pessimist on it, but a long-term optimist. And the danger is being too early with suboptimal solutions. And I think, again, the environmentalists have been calling, if, if we were to listen to Amory Lovins and what he wanted us to do 30 years ago, it would have been an absolute disaster because we would have put, you know, ridiculous, we would have built out, you know, ridiculously inefficient, uh, rudimentary solar and wind turbines. And yeah, we would have had some learning by doing, but the technology wasn't there. And I think conservatives actually played a valuable role in the, the political ecosystem, if you will, and just kind of slowing down a premature green, green stampede and getting it to a point where we begin to have some of these technologies, particularly in energy, um, where they could be viable. They're, they're not fully there yet to be economically competitive with fossil fuels, but you can kind of see, particularly if we got some storage technologies working, you could at least see a pathway. And 20 years ago, when Environmentalists are basically saying the same things they're saying now, but, but far less correctly. There wasn't that pathway. And it's worth noting that Governor Romney in his energy platform has stressed a strong support for basic R&D as, as a core feature of his energy policy. So with that, I'd like to thank you and thanks to the organizers as well. I don't usually do sort of informal off-the-cuff talks like that, and I'm rarely asked to speak as a conservative at universities about this. It's, it's invariably, uh, oh, well, we'll just put some token Republican on the panel, uh, but, but to kind of get a whole group of conservatives to talk about environmentalism from the perspective of conservatism and, and what that means, uh, environmentalism and environmental protection in a conservative context, is, uh, is very rewarding, and I'd like to thank you for inviting me to participate. Thank you so much, Jeremy and Eli. That was really great. Um, all right, we'll dive right into the questions. Um, this question comes from Professor Jim Salzman, um, and it relates to both of you touched on um, subsidies and um, the desirability of removing subsidies from different energy industries. Um, he asks, uh, China, Germany, and other countries provide significant subsidies for renewables and among other industries. Um, so if the, if the U.S. government is concerned about um, staying competitive in the global marketplace, what should we do about subsidies if it might risk the loss of industry competitiveness? Subsidies don't make industries competitive. That's been the overwhelming finding of industrial policies. In general, industries that are successful under countries that do these things are successful in spite of, not because of the subsidies. A regulatory environment that's fair, predictable, low tax, promotes private capital, will be much better for private business overall than, than, the, uh, than enormous subsidies. I would also add that one thing the government can do, and I think must do, is support a fair amount of basic research and have applied research subsidies in the forms of things like the broad R&D tax credit. The idea that we're somehow going to lose competitiveness if we don't subsidize these things is, uh, I think, unsubstantiated. Uh, so I, I wouldn't necessarily disagree uh, broadly with that, but let me just add a, a few thoughts of my own on this. Um, I, I think uh, th there's a couple things. One, uh, there's been a lot of malinvestment from government-directed energy subsidies over the past. And I think if you look at the, the Chinese, or the, the German and uh, Spanish, say, solar deployments, and you look at the economics of that, it's just been a disaster. And now that those company, countries are partially because of policies like this throughout their economy uh, in, in economic crisis, they're pulling back and we're seeing the amount of misinvestment. Um, Secondly, you have to even look, people sort of have a fetish about manufacturing certain things here, and, and the administration has been particularly guilty of this. I was talking to a venture capitalist uh, out in, uh, in the Valley who made the point that, look, um, 
you know, for, for every one job we'd get at a solar manufacturing facility, there's like 15 or 20 jobs in installation, which is, by the way, also not exportable to China undercutting us. So the thing you want to do is, if China wants to subsidize low-cost solar for us, then my view is great. Um, I mean, it's a poor, I think it's bad industrial policy by China, but it's great for us, and over the long term, um, you know, we'll do better to concentrate on those installation jobs. Um, and to the extent that they're truly unfair trade practices, we should take them up through WTO. Yeah, I, I, would, I would second all of that. It's also worth noting, and this is one of my favorite facts that almost nobody knows, the largest segment of manufacturing in the United States and every other country, virtually every other country, is grocery store items. That's actually what most, that's the biggest single part of manufacturing here and everywhere else. So. Thank you. Um, the next question is for Eli, and it's um, what, uh, what accomplishments have you um, noted from the Green Scissors Initiative, and um, did working closely with Friends of the Earth change any of your organization's uh, views? Uh, accomplishments first. Well, I mentioned flood insurance as a major accomplishment, and that was largely as a result of actions of the Green Scissors partners, I would argue. Some other areas where Green Scissors objectives have been advanced are on certain ethanol subsidies have been significantly reduced. I wouldn't say in any way that's primarily the Green Scissors, although the Green Scissors partners were involved. There have been certain Army Corps projects and certain efforts by the Corps to grow its own budget that have been successfully opposed. Uh, there are a number of other things that I could point to in particular. It's worth noting that the Green Scissors campaign is 15 years old. I've been involved in it myself for only three. Uh, Friends of the Earth and Taxpayers for Common Sense have been the leaders of it through most of it. In terms of changing opinions, I I'm not sure if either at Heartland or are straight if my general opinions about issues have changed. My opinions about the ability to work with people who don't agree with me on the overwhelming majority of issues in general and to find common ground and to realize that in many cases groups, particularly groups like Friends of the Earth that really are out on the rather far left can often come around to the right in many ways. Uh, Friends of the Earth, for example, opposed Waxman Marque, which I, I didn't know, for reasons that are virtually the opposite of why I opposed <laughs> them, but nonetheless, they opposed that bill, and they were the only large environmental group that did, and I respect them for that. And in fact, I some, and learning more about their reasons, I agree with some of them. Enormous amounts of corporate welfare, yeah, that's a good reason to oppose a law. So that's where I'd, uh, that's how I'd answer it. Do you think that working with you changed any of Friends of the Earth's perspectives? Well, you'd have to ask them, but I, I think that they probably had many of the same things. I don't think they changed any of their fundamental values, nor would I expect them to, but I hope that they found somebody who's very much on the right, who they could work with on certain issues and understood where we come from, where we were coming from, and occasionally come to the same conclusions for entirely different reasons, and once in a while for the same reasons, particularly about corporate welfare. Thank you. Um, and this is our last question before we break for lunch. Um, you both note, and I think most of our speakers today will note, that um, conservatism and conservative values have a lot to offer um, for environmental issues. Um, and if that's true, why do you think that um, national political uh, races, uh, in national political races, conservative candidates seem um, afraid to engage with those issues or seem hesitant to do so? Well, I, I kind of touched on this a little bit about particularly the way I think climate change became a religious issue and where there were people like myself who were attempting to be constructive. And I don't, I, I'm not saying that I was really the worst recipient by any stretch. I was a very minor recipient. But, but there were others who kind of got up and in very principled ways made critiques that frankly now are being adopted as mainstream once all the stuff we said happened, happened. Um, uh, you know, but who were attacked in very personal ways. And I think the same way, you know, these guys, a lot of these politicians had campaigns run against them with lots of dollars. Um, 
and so I think it just, it's sort of, some of the religious, some of the values-based things, some of the being lectured by Hollywood types. I mean, so I spent a bunch of time at the Republican National Convention uh, talking to all the, the sort of senior folks and, and activists uh, this year. And, I mean, it just, it just makes them steam, you know, when they see that sort of stuff. And they should, because a lot of these folks are just, they're middle American folks, you know, they're driving their Ford F-150, and they don't want to be told they can't, and they don't want to be especially lectured by Brad Pitt about it, you know? And, and I don't blame them. And so I think that, that a lot of the cultural self-righteousness is going to have to disappear from the environmental movement before, you know, before the obstructionists on the right, who do exist, I'm not going to say they don't, um, can be sort of moved away and you can find some, some common ground. But a lot of the silliness on the left, in my view, is going to have to disappear for that to happen. Yeah, I would second all of that. I, I like Leonardo DiCaprio saying that to save the environment, he flies commercial whenever possible, <laughs> instead of his private plane, uh, whenever possible. But <laughs> in any case, I, I think that all of that is correct. I think that there is, in the same way that there is on the left, in the same way that a portion of the environmental movement, although a smaller portion than I used to think, sees this as sort of a, a religious issue, there's a portion of the right that views it in the same way and in almost exactly the same terms. I've had colleagues who have basically said that just as there are people on the left who say, if we don't pass climate change bills, there will be some enormous apocalypse and everybody will die and only the polar regions will be habitable. There are people on the right who are saying, if we do, these things will happen. That's just as bad and it's the same, it's the same thing. The fact is that there are liberals and conservatives and they differ because they're liberals and conservatives, not because of these nefarious agendas. Right. For, oh. uh, I'm, I'm sorry, just, just to add to that, I, I guess I'd say also just um, the actual effect of some of these regulations that were put in place with good intentions in the 70s became increasingly apparent. This was the Sagebrush Rebellion out west and other things. Um, I think our takings, attitude to our takings regulation, I think we've got to find a compromise there. Um, the notion that you just go ahead and, and take private property without compensation, I don't think is, is realistic. It just, it made people angry at a personal level. I met somebody at RNC, actually from Oregon, who's totally, I mean, now is a big leader in the Oregon Republican Party, was totally non-activist until her father's farm, he died, they wanted to subdivide it in some ways that were actually very conservation oriented for the most part, but wanted to have a few development parcels. You know, were told by some regulation that they couldn't do it, even though frankly it was eminently sensible, at least that she described it to me. And it just, you know, it turned her into a conservative political activist. So it, it's stuff like that and, and the, the inflexibility of, of our current regulations and laws in many cases that just, you know, have caused justified anger from a lot of people, turned a lot of people into conservatives, particularly out west. Yeah, I, uh, I'm actually one of them who was turned into a conservative in part by watching environmental environmentalists go crazy <laughs> over things. It certainly had an effect on me, so absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, thanks everyone for joining us for the morning sessions. I hope you've enjoyed it. And after lunch, um, there's a pizza buffet in the um, information area. And um, our keynote speaker, Bob Inglis, will be um, talking right after lunch. And that's going to be really great. And the afternoon panels are going to be awesome, too. So we really hope you'll stick around. Thanks so much. Thank you.